Hello, passionate about sustainability, energy, and climate? You're in the right place. Welcome to Energetic. I'm Maureen Cornelis, and together we will engage with people who dedicate their lives to climate justice and making a just energy transition happen. They may be activists, scientists, policymakers, or other enthusiasts, just like you. Let the life stories and insights inspire you to build a better future for people and the planet. Introducing Juan Pablo Cardenas, the unstoppable environmental engineer shaking up Colombia's energy landscape. Armed with a degree from EIA University in Colombia and a master's in energy and development studies from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, Juan Pablo's passion lies in building sustainable energy communities. From pioneering Colombia's first peer-to-peer -peer energy exchange to spearheading energy community pilots, he's all about empowering people to take control of their energy future. His innovative work has caught the attention of global organizations like Transactive Energy Colombia and the IEA Users TCB. In this episode, we'll discover how Juan Pablo is revolutionizing the Colombian energy landscape, one community at a time. Juan Pablo? Welcome to Energetic. Thank you, Maureen. That was an impressive introduction. I hope I uh, <laughs> I can honor it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. So from environmental engineering to energy communities, so what is sparking your interests and is leading you to pursue studies and a career in, in those fields? Yeah, maybe we can start with a very short story of how I decided to be an environmental engineer and how my career path has been uh, so far. Mainly when I was in, in high school and I discovered that there was a career choice where you could study both biology and economics and business at the same time, it, it really caught my attention. So I've, I've always been very curious on different disciplines and environmental engineering was this mix of everything <laughs> in the same program. And it also had this edge of, uh, okay, you're going to save the world basically and be a, the career of the future and stuff like that. Then when you when when you start your undergrad and and start working on it, uh, there's a reality check when you realize what what is the purpose of uh, what they're training you for, and I didn't like it at all uh, very much. So uh, an environmental engineer in the most general sense of the word and and how environmental engineers practice in Colombia, uh, most of them become kind of uh, like facilitators for projects or companies to be able to operate basically. So they get the environmental licenses and they make sure that they have social licenses with the communities around and then they become kind of uh, just something to tick a checklist uh, of what a development project such a, uh, as a highway or a mine or an energy infrastructure needs to do to operate. So I didn't like that because it wasn't um, very creative. It was like, okay, a project has a lot of environmental impacts. Uh, you need to monitor them and then you need to ask permission for the authority to be able to operate. So I work a bit on that uh, in, uh, during my career, but then I was very attracted to energy because of the same principle of what I chose environmental engineering. It was because energy is everything. Energy is so immersed in how our civilization works that it basically connects with any discipline and with, with all sorts of societal issues and environmental issues. So I jumped to these research projects on energy and it was not just traditional energy, but it was very forward looking and innovative. And that's how I got into the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, exchange pilot that we run and the Transactive Energy Initiative, which is what I've been working on for the past years. So how is the energy landscape looking in Colombia? And uh, I mean, you are currently living in South Africa. So is there other really things that you would like to put into perspective I mean, you spent most of your life in Colombia. Most listeners don't know anything about the Colombian energy landscape. So it's uh, time to get some ideas about how it's uh, the challenges and uh, the perspective at stake. And I'm also really curious to understand how, with your background, you perceive the situation in South Africa. Sure. Maybe to start with uh, the little story about Colombia and also about South Africa. So I can be what you would call or what people can call in Colombia a blackout baby or a blackout child. And it was a, like a very important point in the Colombians electricity system development in the past years. So in, in between 92 and 93, that's how old I am, <laughs> we had a blackout. Basically, Colombia's uh, electricity comes mainly from hydropower plants. 
So we had a very strong El Nino phenomenon, which is uh, uh, which causes a uh, dry season in Colombia. And mixed with a lot of other stuff, we have a mainly centralized government operated uh, electricity system. So we had a blackout and in the blackout, it lingered in the Colombian culture. So for my parents, for instance, they, there's this very uh, popular radio show uh, that was developed during those times where there, where there was blackout during the nighttime. And so that lingered in the imagination of, of Colombians but it also changed the way the electricity system operated. So it was like a wake-up call. So after the blackout, the authorities reacted, and that's when Colombia's electricity system got modernized, and that's how it's been operating since then. So the governmental centralized uh, system became uh, liberalized, basically allowed private investors, they allowed uh, private companies to operate in the different uh, activities of the sector, generation, transmission, distribution, and retailing. They created uh, independent oversight institutions related to the government, but independent on their judgment to regulate and plan the energy sector. So it was a positive shock uh, on, of somehow. So it, now Colombia has uh, one of the most reliable and robust energy systems in the region. And that's uh, that. Uh, I made the relationship today because 30 years later, I'm here in South Africa and, and now I'm uh, living myself the, the blackout experience. So in South Africa, since some years now, and uh, especially last year and this year, we've been experiencing low shedding many times a day. In 2022, uh, we had an average two hours of low shedding a day. In 2023, so far this year, we have already more hours of low shedding than we had throughout the whole 2022. So it's an average six hours a day of low shedding in the country, and it's because there's no enough generation capacity to supply for the country's demand, which is unbelievable in a, in a country as South Africa, which is one of the biggest economies in Africa. And it also, in the paper, uh, technically it's supposed to have an installed capacity of over 50 gigawatts, uh, mostly coal power station, which is even more surprisingly because it's supposed to be very reliable. But for a lot of technical and political issues, it's having this crisis right now, which is impacting heavily both the political landscape and the economy, of course, and and it's adding up to uh, well the, all the many problems that, that that South Africa has. So I guess that's the link that I made with with my what happened in Colombia, how I perceive the electricity sector in Colombia, because we rarely have any any blackouts, any problems. Uh, electricity prices are very reasonable, even in these times of crisis and high energy prices. So now it's uh, it's good to look at the at the other side of the coin of of what can happen, and and maybe go back to think about maybe this is the shocking moment for South Africa to start organizing better how the electricity system works. Yeah, it's about uh, learning from lessons from the past and, uh, and trying to build more resilience. That supposes also looking into uh, more decentralized and uh, decarbonized generation capacity, because as you said, in South Africa, most of the electricity comes from coal. And I would expect also generators uh, to function on kerosene when there are blackouts, general blackouts on the grid. So that creates a lot of pollution, a lot of CO2 emissions, which are, of course, very challenging and very, very bad for the climate and very bad for the people. So that's really interesting how you manage to put things into perspective, because I'm sure that if you decide to come back to Colombia, you will have all those really direct experience of load shedding and of uh, of blackouts in mind and really as ways to, to build your career fr from that, that nobody should ever experience blackouts anymore and load shedding anymore as well. It's not the first time you talk. Last time we talked, we were actually together in, in Pretoria in, in South Africa, and we also visited uh, together uh, Soweto, the township of Soweto. And, you know, when I was really, really shocked to see the difference between what we notice in big cities in in very fancy environment like Pretoria and in some areas of Soweto as well. And it was really the unbelievable level of poverty was was really, really high as well. And those two extremes are accorbitating. In practice, it also means that the level of access to electricity differs a lot and some people overconsume while some other totally underconsume and the levels of energy poverty are extremely high. And 
Is it also something like this kind of inequalities that you notice in the in the Colombian landscape? Or, you know, uh, has the measures that you mentioned earlier, has they been able also to to fill some of the inequalities and some of the inequities in the in the way energy was arriving to people's home? Yes, yes. Let's try to talk about like orders of magnitude. Uh, I was uh, looking up some uh, some data about the latest uh, inequality indexes, how how that is reflective of, of of a country and how it's made and by whom, but it gives a, an idea of, of it. So it's about uh, 196 countries. Italy, for instance, it's uh, on, the, on the position like 150, something like that, very low. Colombia is in the 20th position the 20th most unequal country on earth. So we're right up there. And then South Africa is the first. The most unequal country on earth is South Africa right now. So I've been discussing with uh, with a lot of people here and people that are very critical about South Africa's progress because South Africa's history is very recent and the political transition for South Africa to democracy and to have uh, civil rights for most of its population, it's 30 years old. Uh, so South Africa is very impressive in that sense and in the sense of when the apartheid regime fell, the willingness to gain the resources of the state and to give basic services to the broadest population that could be possible. So South Africa right now has almost universal electricity access, but the problem is more about energy poverty than access. So they may be access, but people basically can afford to buy electricity. So that's a, an important difference. And and in Colombia, it's, it's the same. And we kind of have more structure mechanisms to to deal with that. So in Colombia, I think the, the figure is 97% of, of access to electricity. There's about 1 million people in the country without access. And these are people in very remote areas, which are, which are still struggling for, for access and, and for which they just... Connecting them to the interconnected main system is, is not viable. So the, the main thing, and it's something that we're seeing now in the world, because now we're the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis, we're talking about energy poverty in Europe as well. And I think what I talked about you, that it, that it's a, that it's many families, in, in, even in Europe, are struggling to, to meet the, their electricity needs. So I think the conversation is shifting to, uh, to more about energy poverty, and then the question is how you do it. So in South Africa, there's something called the free basic electricity allowance or, or, or level, which is basically a, a basic amount of electricity that some families, depending on their situation, they are uh, entitled to receive by the government. It doesn't work very efficiently in, in many areas and it has a lot of criticism, but they have that in place, but it's definitely not enough. And in Colombia, we have a cross-subsidy mechanism in which not only for electricity bills and electricity purposes, but for many other things. In Colombia, we have a socioeconomic strata system. So it's a, a system in which the government defines uh, certain city sectors and certain uh, territorial sectors depending on their wealth levels. And that is uh, determined by many variables, depending on the type of construction, depending on, on the type of uh, families living there, their income, the the facilities, a lot of factors take into account. And then some institution from the government is in charge of determining which uh, city sector is on what socioeconomic strata. So it goes from one to six. One is the lowest one, the poorest population, and six is the wealthiest population. So for the electricity sector, we have a cross subsidy uh, in which the wealthiest uh, citizens in strata five and six they pay always a contribution in their energy bills. They tax them. Uh, it's a 20% contribution over the energy, or over the amount they pay in their bills. And those subsidies go to people uh, in strata one, two, and three. So that's somehow a way of accounting for that uh, different level of access and, and, to, and to somehow take into account the, the inequality that Colombia has and make it more affordable. Besides that, there are a lot of uh, mechanisms for, uh, let's say, people in non-interconnected zones. And non-interconnected doesn't mean that they don't have access to electricity. It's just that they are not connected to the main interconnected system of the country. So Colombia's territory is very complex, uh, very uh, broken in so many ways. So we have the Andes mountain range. We have the Amazon uh, rainforest. 
So it's very difficult terrain, and so so the government defined, okay, we have the, the main interconnected system, and for isolated communities, we have uh, non-interconnected solutions. So they also have some uh, other benefits and some access to funding uh, by the government to ensure that people have access and to decrease that level of energy poverty so people can have a basic electricity in their homes. In this context, what led you to launch or join the energy community uh, pilots? I mean, in Europe, there is a lot of, let's say, passion for this topic with the energy communities being seen as a way to contrast energy poverty um, because it reduces transportation costs, for instance. And, you know, the social component of the energy communities, it's really at the center of the two relevant energy directives, so energy laws uh, that govern like the urban system somehow. So what really motivated you? And you've published recently a document, a really interesting analysis of energy communities in the Colombian context. So maybe you could develop a little bit on the energy communities that you have worked on and really the kind of lessons that you would like to, or a message that you would like to promote to, to, to some parties that think of energy communities, but don't know exactly how that would apply to their context. Let's talk about the, how we began to think about these models. So there's like a broader category, which we call user center energy systems. And it's basically we, we talk about all the time. So the electricity system used to be linear, only one direction. Uh, the electricity flows one way and then the money comes from the users and, and everyone benefits from it. So now with distributed energy resources and new generation technologies and digitalization, that is changing. So the paradigm is changing. We have seen the, the rise of the prosumer as a very important figure and something that is changing, especially the retailing and distribution activities in the, in the energy sector. So we started to see that and our objective or our goal was, okay, Let's try to bring that that is happening and that, that we're now seeing is happening in, in Europe. And uh, I work with uh, Juan Manuel España and he's the director of the initiative and he worked in Bangladesh with a company called SoulShare in, in something called uh, Swarm Electrification, which is basically make microgrids more robust by joining people together. So he came with these ideas and we, uh, and we say, okay, how does this apply to Colombia? And then that's when we started to think about peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and the energy communities. And our first condition or our first clarity on what we wanted to do, because this was four years ago, and this was very new in the whole world, we started to work with some uh, groups in, uh, in London, and, and, and that's the users, TCP from the International Energy Agency. So this was just starting to get mo gain momentum. Now everyone is talking about peer-to-peer -peer energy communities, but back then it was very, it was somehow very obscure and new things. But our first clarity about that was that if we were going to deploy pilots and apply things, we were going to do it with uh, what we would call the normal Colombian citizens. And the, and the regular, everyday Colombian citizens are not wealthy people. And that's, that's just the reality. If you take an average Colombian, it, it, it will be someone in strata three, which is like right in the middle of the, of the socioeconomic things that we, that we just discussed. So we say, okay, we need to involve people that still don't have access to distributed energy resources. So Colombia uh, in the past years has, have a, has had a, an increase in, in installation of solar PV and batteries and electric vehicles, maybe as anywhere else in the world, basically, but they are only accessible by wealthy and knowledgeable people that know that they can do it. So our, our energy community had uh, that design principle from the start that we wanted to do it with users that represents the bulk of the Colombian population to really understand how it could impact this population segment lives and how can they become part of the transition that was going on. And uh, because they basically to participate in the transition right now, it, it, it's, uh, it comes with a price. So the ticket to, uh, to buy into the transition is uh, either you buy a, even a, just a smart meter or you buy a, a solar panel or you buy an electric vehicle and that's how prosumers are, are right now. But then it needs to be expanded to everyone, basically. And that's what the just transition is about. So that was the principle. And we started with working on an energy community. Our energy community, it's on a neighborhood in Medellin, which is Strata 3. We're not talking about poor citizens. Uh, there are working class, average 
middle class Colombians in a neighborhood that could be uh, any neighborhood in Colombia. And that's the interesting part, which is it's not we're not talking about super wealthy users that can do it. And we're not talking about uh, vulnerable communities that have uh, pressing needs or access issues. They have a reliable supply. They have uh, decent life quality levels. And that's where we chose to deploy our pilot. And besides that, our pilot has been basically, let's make this work in practice. It sounds like a, a, like a very basic objective, but it's been really like that. So we wanted to have, a, we wanted to deploy a community which was real, which functions in the energy system, because that's what energy communities are. It's just a group of people that perform an activity in the, in the electricity system. And it's been a, a quite a challenge. And it's on the side of the users, because we arrive to the community and we tell the neighbors in the community, okay, this is what an energy community could look like. Are you willing to participate? You wanna, do you wanna join us and, and build this together? So that's what a big difference. It's, uh, and it's a big difference with how energy communities originated in Europe. So in Europe is basically a, a grassroots movement of people that get together and say, okay, we're going to get empowered of our energy consumption or our energy generation. We're going to create this business model or we're going to sell consume and then they find a means to do it. But then we, when you don't have the knowledge and when people are so far away from, uh, from the technologies and from what's going on, you need to have this initiator that in this case was us as an initiative. And we find this group of neighbors and we say, okay, do you want to participate? Do you want to, do you want to work in this with us? And it was this group of neighbor, uh, like already constituted as a neighborhood assembly or anything, or were they people who were already talking to each other, uh, is what I mean. Or were they kind of strangers? Because that's also, I mean, in Europe, we still face those kind of issues, like how to put people together, because maybe you have a couple of people who are interested, but some other may not be. So, you know, it's all about like getting people motivated. And maybe in Europe, we have overall uh, greater purchasing power, but there are still a lot of people who struggle and energy communities, uh, I mean, depending on the model, they may be facing some liquidity issues or, you know, the money may always be a kind of a concern. So how did you manage to constitute this, this group? And I mean, from what I understand, you, you brought the idea to them and you brought also like the, the financial capacity for this energy community. But what was the reaction of the people? Yes. So first of all, we needed... Uh some sort of uh, connection point, an entry point to the community. And that's a very important thing. And it's what, what we have identified and we identify with other types of communitary models that we study and also with, uh, with what's happening in other parts of the world, that you need to have some sort of community leadership or a community leader or a, or, or a community representative that is willing to consider the option of doing it and that makes the bridge between you as an initiator of, of, or as a person interested in developing that sort of project and the community. So that's the first part. And the, and, and the connection point we had is, uh, is this person that participated in, uh, in, the, in the previous pilot. So the peer-to-peer -peer exchange we did in, in Medellin as well was more focusing on individual prosumers and connecting those individual prosumers in the peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So it was a virtual thing, a virtual network of users connected across the city. It was somehow simpler in terms of uh, regulatory models because we didn't change or we didn't try to change how things work. There's already a legal figure for prosumers in Colombia. So we did that. Our innovation with that or, or the new thing we did is that we created prosumers or we convinced uh, some citizens to become prosumers in neighborhoods where uh, there's no PV systems uh, ever. So there were these kind of a diversification of how uh, of context where PV systems could be deployed. So that's how we uh, met Rodrigo. So Rodrigo is, uh, is, is the, the person that we knew from this neighborhood and he became part of the project. The peer-to-peer -peer exchange was mostly uh, exploratory in terms of gathering energy data. In Colombia, the smart metering is still very uh, a very new thing. So it was a way to gather load and generation profiles from users that were completely unmetered in, in general. So it was more of an of exploratory project. But then Rodrigo was our contact there, and 
when we started the second stage of the initiative, which was the, the solar community, we approached him and told him the idea and he was very enthusiastic about it. And he was like, of course, if more people can benefit from this, I'm completely willing to do it. And the other thing, so the, so the first thing is have a connection point with, with uh, some local leadership. And the second one is that it really helps if the, basically what you were saying, if the neighbors know each other, if they have collaborated previously on other things, so not maybe not related to energy. So for instance, in La, in La Estrecha, which is our, our, our community in Medellin, they know each other. They have uh, worked together previously, uh, putting some uh, security cameras in their block and they talk to each other about community issues. So there was already like some sort of uh, social fabric that allow us to uh, to get there. And and then they organize themselves. They say, okay, we're, we're going to do the meeting here and Rodrigo gets them together. And then uh, it makes easier for, for the, to share the idea. Uh, another very important thing was that Rodrigo already had PV systems. So when Rodrigo had the PV systems, all the neighbors were like, well, what is that? You know, how could we get it? And Rodrigo told me, okay, it reduces my electricity bill. And they were like, wow, the, the, that is good. And then it was somehow uh, simpler to flow the community idea to them via these uh, previous experience and via having a, a some sort of uh, salient leadership figure there. And what was the reaction from the authorities, whether it is the government of Medellin or the utilities, how the regulators maybe, how did they react to this idea? And do they also study this case now as maybe a way to promote a greater access to quality electricity elsewhere in Colombia? Okay, yeah, that's a super important point because it's uh, there are so many actors that could promote or block these kinds of uh, these kinds of models that it, it's it is very important to have the a completely clear map of everyone that has some influence on the development of these models so the first thing and it's very important is that we are working alongside uh, EPM with this so EPM is our partner and they have developed the project with us and EPM is the local utility company which is both distributed network operator and the retailer of these users. So it's the local utility that basically services the whole city of Medellin and, and beyond. Yeah, so it's the vertically in integrated utility of Medellin, EPM. Yes, yes. Uh, in Medellin okay. and in many other areas of the, of the, of the country, it's, uh, I think, the biggest, uh, the biggest utility in the country. Okay. So basically, we couldn't have done it with them. Okay. Because we, as as we work with the with the innovation department from the utility, we have access and we have willingness from the distributor and the retailer of these users to to innovate and to and to basically conduct this. So that's a very important first point. And then it's been a, a process through. So it's it's been not just deploying the community or make the community work, but it's been also a, in parallel, we've developed some uh, education and outreach strategies where we try to sit down with the regulators, with the Ministry of Energy, which is like the highest authority of the sector in Colombia, and try to uh, start talking to them about these topics. With the city of Medellin itself uh, and the local government, uh, we had some uh, very brief contacts not so much. And it's because the, of the nature of the electricity system in Colombia is very centralized in the, the national government. So the national government uh, defines the authorities and defines how the uh, companies are structured, uh, but the local governments don't have many saying of what happens in their jurisdiction because it's more centralized on the, on the national government and the Ministry of Mines and Energy. And then something happened last year. So we had national elections and we had a new president And suddenly uh, the energy community topics exploded because the new government came with energy communities as one of their flagships for the development of, of the energy transition. And they came with a very strong view of how uh, of the of developing a roadmap for uh, Colombia's just energy transition. So suddenly it went from uh, only us, maybe the four, four or five people talking about energy communities And now the whole country is talking about energy communities. <laughs> so it's really creating a momentum. Uh, so it's like paving uh, the way for the golden age of uh, energy communities in Colombia. Are there many actors that want to get into the Colombian markets? Or 
Is it coming from like international partners, international projects? So it's uh, an initiative by the uh, by the government. It, it even got into the the national development plan. It's, it's stated mm-hmm. there that that energy communities is going to be a an instrument for the for the just energy transitions of the country. And and the funny thing is that it's we've realized it happens a lot with uh, when we talk about this subject. It sounds pretty cool and it sounds like something that makes a lot of sense. But it's also something that people don't really know how to do it or how how to implement it. So right now the government, there were elections last year, and it's this is basically the first year of government. And now uh, what happens is that they need to take what what they wrote in the in the national development plan, which is very broad and just a nice idea, and and bring it down to concrete uh, legislation about how to do it. And that's what the mean what the Ministry of, of of Energy is doing right now, and and they're currently developing the first sort of energy communities, but focusing on non connected areas. So for mostly for energy access and energy poverty, and that's our point. And that's basically what's the goal of the of the report uh, that we wrote about uh, about energy communities, and it's like trying to. Uh, raise awareness that this is basically our point is an energy community is it needs to be more than just a pv system uh, set on the rooftop of a community so that is not an energy community that just that's just a distributed energy system and then we're trying to get into the discussion of what needs to happen and the differences and the nuances between for instance energy communities in europe that happen bottom up was grassroots movement or energy communities in a context, in a Colombian context, where you have the government or an initiative like ours, and you try to get people to do it, and you're providing funding and you're providing knowledge, but then the benefits for the community and how this is important is what's debatable there. Yeah, really, the top-down uh, approach compared to a more bottom-up approach that we 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 often see in Europe. So, what do you think the challenge are ahead uh, of you and the energy community model in Colombia and maybe you want to reflect on on the energy transition in general as well yes so for the energy transition and basically from a point of view of Colombia's sustainability transition or, or complying with the NDCs and the climate change goals it's all connected and it, i think energy communities can be like a like an instrument for tackling a lot of things and, and that, that's what i think it's is is most important about about these models and it's like you don't need to talk about energy communities to deploy distributed generation distributed generation uh, everyone knows how to do it the technologies are there but then the focus is on what are the communities doing uh, with this and how are, how are they benefiting so there, are the, I see different levels of of these benefits and how they contribute to that transition. So first, you have uh, energy access and energy poverty, which are very uh, obvious, and you have better prices and people doing it to get uh, savings and an additional income, which I think it may be uh, with environmental concerns the the key motivations for energy communities in the European context. On a, another step, you have grid reliability you have energy community we have this distributed generation that can contribute to have a more uh, reliable system if the adequate technologies and, and mechanisms are in place and then the the level that i see is on the synergies that this can have with other sustainable development goals because when you arrive at uh, at a community uh, and especially when you're talking about this top down model where you arrive at a community that they don't have a high income, they can access higher education, but then you get with this model that is something very tangible and you bring some education components because you teach them how energy works, you teach them how energy systems work, how they can impact things with their behavior as energy users. You bring digitalization because now the... Energy community usually has some uh, digital component behind it. You have a user interface that that enables that people know exactly how much they're generator and how much they're consuming. And then you you get like this rolling ball of of added things that can be plugged into these models. 
So the thing is, for Colombia's energy transition, electricity generation in Colombia is only about eight eight percent of of the total uh, CO two emissions. The Colombian energy matrix is very clean. It's mostly based on hydropower. But our problem is the is that since it's depending on hydropower, it's very vulnerable to El Nino phenomenon that it can be and it will be made worse by climate change. Uh, so our our interest is to diversify, and in and, and and in this diversifying and having renewable sources, distributed generation through energy communities can be a, a big solution. So you've been facing many load shading in the past year, and all your life is about load shading and how to overcome <laughs> them. So do you think energy communities are a resilience tool somehow for for population, for the climate, for our grids, and for our economies somehow as well? I think they are, and I think that's the the biggest uh, potential for energy communities, and it's to create local uh, sustainability and local uh, climate resiliency, both in terms of adapt adaptation, because you are bringing renewable energies and you are bringing education about efficiency and a more conscious uh, use of resources, but also for adaptation, because when you have community cohesion or when you promote community cohesion, you have communities that are better prepared to face whatever is coming. Because in Medellin it happens all the time and in Colombia, we have a very severe Nina like we had uh, on past years, which is a very rainy season and they have a, a landslides and floodings and things. And then we have a very, uh, we have El Nino, very dry season where we have uh, where we start struggling for electricity and, and, and water and the agriculture gets a, a hit as well. So I think energy communities as a way of deploying a tangible solution for communities to get together around sustainability is their biggest potential. And I think Colombia especially uh, really needs that uh, in terms of the challenges it faces. So. Colombia right now, uh, the biggest source of emissions for Colombia, it's, uh, it's uh, deforestation. And deforestation comes from both illegal activities and, uh, and ways of development that are extractivist, and the country has so much better alternatives to it. And I think the government, through this type of energy communities, could really make a uh, an impact on bringing an alternative to those more destructive and extractivist activities and bring the discussion back into more sustainable and other development pathways, which is uh, basically what is needed. Not, not just, okay, how are we going to stop it and how are we going to stop communities to, to, to stop the deforesting, but then what are the alternatives for them? So we were thinking about how about having Uh, energy communities that are also forest rangers or, uh, or community rangers of or things that uses the, uh, the the basic thing of of generating and self-consuming electricity but that stick to what the development pathway for the for the community could be that's really super fascinating and super inspiring because when you think about all that you also think about the resources, like the knowledge of the indigenous communities and what they can bring into a, a community perspective, into a sustainability discussion overall. And so, Juan Pablo, now we are reaching the end of our, this absolutely fascinating conversation. Where can we see you in the next years? What are your projects? Because now you are finishing your your master's in South Africa. So where are you going now? That's a, that's a great question. I, I and I don't have a concrete answer. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, um, I'm maybe in a in a pivotal point in my in my career where I find uh, some. That's a very good closing point because it ties together for more, where, where I started when I tell you that I wanted to be become an environmental engineer because of the multidisciplinarity of it and the impact. So. In my experience, both in Colombia and South Africa, I've seen the potential and the challenges that especially the global South can have, and but also how the problems and solutions that are being developed in our countries, how they could help developed economies to do it. And especially in South Africa, I, I really believe that it's South Africa finds a way of solving the 
climate crisis, the energy crisis, and their political and inequality crisis, they could save the world because South Africa is a microcosmos of how the planet is working. You have big, rich people polluting, and then you have a, a lot of poor people suffering the consequences, and it's all happening here in the same space. So for my career steps, I would like to continue working on that intersection, intersection between countries, intersection between contexts, and taking some uh, solutions that may still not be possible and try to uh, apply them uh, in contexts where they are needed the most. So that's the date to meet up uh, again in five years, uh, because I'm sure you will have had developed many relevant, interesting uh, projects uh, with uh, different partners. And it's also a very nice way to tie with the previous conversation that we've had on Energetic. Please uh, listen to them, uh, the conversation with uh, Rashita Misra from the Salco Foundation in India, with Simone Mangeli from uh, the Climate Neutral City Alliance, gathering um, many innovative uh, big cities around the world. So thank you so much, uh, Juan Pablo. It's been really, really, really fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. And I hope it's not five years uh, till we meet again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to Energetic. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into sustainability and the just energy transition with the most inspiring stakeholders. All links and resources are in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like this podcast, why not recommend it to a friend or a colleague? To continue the conversation, head on over to Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you for lending your ears. That's all for this episode. Until next time.